dog laying down. That was a picture of a trained, a training material, getting ready for the day. Not a hit on something random, not a hit on a body. Detective King found nothing at the landfill that could be sufficiently connected to IS via DNA or anything along those lines. The evidence technician, Detective Lillard, or Officer Lillard, they never located a body. They located some items, again, never connected to IS via DNA or anything along those lines. They talk about some underwear, those underwear that have lips on them that Kimberly Mobley testified, those are ISs. You heard that testimony. Those underwear are a large. IS was a small. She was tiny. She was thin. Never even heard of someone upsizing underwear before. It's absolutely ludicrous. She wasn't pregnant at the time in February of 2018 when these underwear were purchased. You don't upsize underwear. That's not what happened. Those are not her underwear. And the testing done on it shows that there was no evidence, no DNA on that to connect that to IS. Similarly to those two bras that mom says, oh yeah, those look like hers. There's no DNA to connect those to her either. None of those items found in the landfill that they pulled out could be connected to IS in any way. Terry Parker book. You heard from Ed Schmalfeld. I'm going to talk about him a little bit more later. I just want to mention it right now. He told you that items get dumped there from all over. But where did he tell you about the clothing? He told you Goodwill dumps in that same area. He told you that he saw clothing. Officer Lillard didn't want to admit that. Oh, the only clothing we saw were these. But what did Smallfield tell you? No, there was clothing. Detective Bidlick. I'm going to go into some of this later, but Detective Bidlick is the one who wired Morris McClendon. He's the one who set things up, told Morris McClendon, we've had several cases together. You know what to do. You know what this is about. And then Detective Abbott. Detective Abbott, on this stand, admitted to you all that without the confessions and the conversations with his brother, there was no evidence, no physical evidence, to connect Mr. Quillez to the murder of IS, or unborn child, or any sexual battery. It was through those confessions, statements to his brother, that led them down that path. And guess what? Once they heard that, there was no further investigation. There was no further looking into anything. They didn't question Mr. Quillas to find out what was going on. Mr. Quillas's brother told them about that confession. He told them, I don't believe him. He told that to police at the very beginning. That wasn't something he just came up with when he came and talked to you all yesterday. He's been saying that from the beginning. You also heard from Dr. Atchew. Dr. Atchew is the one who confirmed IS's pregnancy. And what did she tell you? She said, she was looking down, IS was looking down. She couldn't really get a read on her. She made a note about wanting to speak to her next time she came into the office alone and to tell that to the front office at the beginning so Kimberly Mobley, her mom, would not come back. She noticed signs of abuse. And that wasn't just related to her being pregnant at 16. Rachel Thomas. Rachel Thomas told you. IS reported that she was a virgin. And her physical examination was consistent with that. 
She said, maybe there was something there. I wanted to get a better look at it. Not sure. She never got a chance to look back because she did not get a follow-up appointment with her. But based on what she saw, she wrote in her report that what was reported by IS was consistent with her examination. Laura Draga, that was the evidence technician who uh, did ballistics on the gun. No evidence that that gun was used in the commission of this crime. None. Only thing she could tell you was what? The gun works. It was preserved with preservative oils. She never stated that it was cleaned. She said that the oils that were left over looked like the type of oils that you use to preserve a gun. Regular usage. And then Nicholas Kutu. You heard from Nicholas Kutu. The majority of the evidence that you heard from him not related to this case in any way, except for those pill bottles. Those pill bottles came back with whose DNA? Kimberly Mobley's. Those pill bottles were found where? In SS's closet. Four months after IS went missing. What did Naomi Mobley tell you? I've never seen those at my house. No other DNA is on that besides Kimberly Mobley's. Nothing to connect Mr. Quillez, except for what I, besides what S has said. The credit union. Oh, let me go back. Those underwear from the rape kit with Kamar Humphrey. I want to be clear what he told you all. He could not tell us definitively if it was from two donors or three donors. He said he put both because he was not sure. If it was from two donors, there is no connection to Jonathan Quillis whatsoever. None, assuming two donors. The credit union custodian that came in. The card was used several times, and you saw that. Several times after IS is alleged to have been murdered. No longer able to use that account. There was a transfer, an internal transfer done on that account. The other internal transfers said what next to it? Nancy Ware, correct? That is what was put on there. Those transfers were done by Nancy Ware. This internal transfer does not have that information. Who was the other person who had access to that account? IS. There were some charges after that as well. Some games played. Those charges are on IS's own account, and Nancy Ware did not testify to using that account at all. I'll remind you of a few things that you heard from Jonathan and Gary Lindros. John Quillez was a great worker. Went above and beyond, would do what was necessary, saw something that needed to be fixed, he would do it. He's working diligently, never noticed anything out of the ordinary on those dates in question. You heard from a, about Google location. What were you told by several witnesses? He Googled Fastenal. Fastenal is a place to go buy parts. Detective Abbott told you that. Well, yeah, those places where you go to buy parts, same kind of parts that we be used at Ace Pick Apart. Jonathan and Gary might not remember asking Mr. Quillez to buy parts. That was a normal part of his job when they needed him to. And he went to Fastenal that day to buy parts. What else did they tell you about this area that was kind of restricted in that at that time? They told you that where he was going, they did have cars that were for storage, 
They had a dirt and gravel pile that he would use for work purposes to fill in ruts and fix roads. And they were also fixing a fence back there. You heard Detective Abbott talk about that. There were several reasons to be in that area. After returning from buying parts for the business on company time, Mr. Quillas heads into that area. Completely normal. In fact, Gary Lindro said, it looks like he just parked right outside of the camera's view. They can't tell you whether he went into some secluded area or anything like that based off of that video. All you know is that he goes into that area for a few minutes. And that's supposed to be enough time to do what? Teams of people worked to process vehicles at Ace Pick Apart. You see Mr. Quillez picking up a vehicle on the 20th. What did Gary Lindros tell you all? Oh yeah, that's gonna go get processed. Team of two people come and they do the first part. Take off this, empty the trash. Team of two people then go do this. Take it to the crusher, do this, remove the battery. All that process of production that he told you about. That wasn't a vehicle that, that just gets crushed and nobody takes a look at it. All right, remember the job of defense is to, to present anything in closing argument to this jury that will make one juror say, well, there it is, that's reasonable doubt, and that's enough to secure an acquittal. Is that going to happen? We'll have to see what the jury does when we come back. Of course, we'll take you back into closing arguments. Tonight on Closing Arguments, an in-depth profile of the accused killer in the Delphi murder case. We'll break down the new details as this defendant awaits trial. Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan. Tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on Court TV. When the That's some of the what the jurors heard during opening statements in the murder trial against 38-year-old Jonathan Quiles. Did the state prove its case despite no forensic evidence? That's what they heard during closing argument. There's no forensic evidence. The defense relied on that. What is this jury going to do? Quiles faces the death penalty if convicted in the murder of his niece, Sayana Sawyer, and the unborn girl. Jurors are now hearing the defense's closing argument. Let's get you back inside court. the only vehicle that got moved that day. You've been told several times it was raining. What did Gary Lindros tell you? He said, on that day, if people weren't able to work, they went home early. When did Mr. Quillez leave that day? Around 2.45 p.m. It was hard to work in the rain out there. There wasn't a whole lot that they could do. No problem. Go home today. Using that bucket versus the forklift. When first talking about that, he's like, ah, oh, it's a little strange. But then when asked, okay, well, doesn't he have to fill ruts in the roads? Doesn't he have to fix the road lands? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, there's dirt and gravel over there. That makes sense. It's a totally normal function of his duties, things that he would do on a regular basis. I encourage you all to look at those videos. You'll see Mr. Quillez walking around, talking, doing his job, going in and out of the office, getting things for people, doing his job as he normally would. Look at him and see if you can tell his demeanor. If he looks like he's suspicious, is that there's something going on? I would submit to you when you look at that, looks like he's working. Talked to you about Ed Schmallfield a few seconds ago. Clothing items. Clothing items from Goodwill are dumped at that landfill. What else did he tell you about that search? That 16 day search at the landfill. He told you they went through 5,500 tons of garbage. He told you the dimensions, and I can't remember. He told you the dimensions, 20 feet deep, three to four acres wide, if I'm not mistaken. He told you he overestimated to make sure that that dumpster that they were concerned about was included in that search. I asked
asked him, would that 5,500 tons of garbage, would that have met your overestimation to include that? He told you yes. Yes, he believed so. They searched. They did not find anything. Billy Brown. Important information from Billy Brown. They only dump at the Otis Road landfill. They don't dump anywhere else. When you're listening to that wire and you're wondering, is what he's telling, is what he's saying truthful? He's talking about Trail Ridge landfill. That's not even a landfill that American garbage dumps at. He claims that someone told him that from American garbage. I would submit to you that he's making that up. The other witnesses you heard from, Damien Hatch. Damien Hatch claims that in 2022, February, let me be specific, he arrived in the same dorm as Mr. Quillez on February 11th, 2022. Started going to a Bible study that Brother D, Ulysses Dixon, runs. Started going to that Bible study on a daily basis. But you know who wasn't going to that Bible study? Mr. Quillez. You know what Damien Hatch told you all? They were going to that Bible study every day together. What did Ulysses Dixon tell you today? That's a lie. They're lying. Damien Hatch is lying. Mr. Quillez and Damien Hatch, Dino, as he's called, never attended Bible study together. Mr. Quillez didn't even go to that Bible study until the end of 2022, maybe the beginning of 2023. And how did Ulysses Dixon know that? He said he'd been trying to get him to come. Really good guy, doing trustee work, helping out people, but he wouldn't go to church. Ulysses didn't get anything for coming here and testifying. He even told you he's a little actually worried. That's going to hurt him. But he came here to tell you all the truth. Tell you all that that was a lie, what you heard from, from Damien Hatch. George Jackson. George Jackson told you all that he was not in control of the wire device. You heard at the beginning of that wire, it jumps. It jumps a couple of times in the beginning. You don't know when it's being turned on. You don't know when it's being turned off. You don't know when it's being restarted again. Mr. Quillez, you heard this from George Jackson, was left alone with Morris McClendon. Morris McClendon, who is an expert at doing these things. He knows how to do what he needs done. He knows how to get information in the way that he needs to, by whatever means necessary. George Jackson wasn't in there. When Mr. Quillez and Morris McClendon were having conversation. But what do you hear at the beginning of that wire? There's razors on the floor. Talk about a razor again. It wouldn't take much to threaten someone, to get them to say what you need them to say. Think about what you heard. Every answer is prompted. It's led. They're feeding information. They're telling him, signaling to him what needs to be said. What did Mr. Quillez's brother tell you? He makes up stories. He's known for it. He is known for coming up with elaborate, wild stories. Joseph Quillis told you, in the family it's a known thing. 
He did it when he was younger. He was caught supposedly high. Instead of telling his mom, oh, hey, just tried it out. He said, I'm a full-blown drug addict. He was sent to a drug rehab program for a year and kept up with that. He was never a drug addict. What did Joseph Quellis tell you? He said he was the only person in that drug rehab program who tested negative for drugs the entire time. He never had drugs in the system. But that's what he knows of his brother. He knows him to run on with these stories and go on even to his own detriment. He told you, if you ask him a question, he's gonna give you an answer because he can't help himself. When he gets into character, he commits. He's gonna perform for you. He's gonna give you that story. He's gonna keep it going. That's what Joseph Quillis told you. Carol Ann Clip. Why do we call Carol Ann Clip? You've already heard some evidence that activity was going on on IS's accounts after the date the state alleges she was murdered. But not only that, she was seen. Carol Ann Clip saw her the day after Christmas. She saw her walking. Carolyn Clip has nothing to gain by coming here. She didn't want to come here. But why? She told you why. She says she called because she believed in her heart and mind that that was IS. <coughs> that was the right thing to do. Same reason she came and testified here today. Kamar Humphrey. I've already talked to you about him. But he lied, he admitted he lied about his whereabouts. Just about a month ago, not even a month ago, he denied even having sexual contact with IS. Why? You've already been charged and pled to a felony battery, so why would you lie? Why would you try to distance yourself I think from she that? may have just pointed out some reasonable doubt to the jury. Joining me this hour to break it all down, retired police sergeant for Nashville PD, Melissa Pinkleton, and here in studio, Deputy Public Defender Philip Dubay. Thank you for being here in person, Melissa. Thank you for joining us. Melissa, let me start with you. With all of your law enforcement experience, when you hear her, albeit in the middle of the closing, Philip, say, uh -huh. A person, a witness who didn't want to testify, testified and said she saw this very girl the day after Christmas. How compelling is that in your opinion? And we I think it's very Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry Melissa. I, I think it's very compelling. And again, to your point, what you were saying, it offers reasonable doubt. I have heard so much reasonable doubt in the entirety of this case. I'm surprised that it was actually brought forward and prosecuted. I mean, we have no body, we have jailhouse snitches, we have so much missing from what a good case looks like when we bring it to a jury to prosecute it. So I think that there is not gonna be beyond a reasonable doubt and the the prosecution is gonna struggle with that. And I think, we want, I think we may see him walk free. On the murder charges, I think you might be right, depending on what the jury decides to do. And one of those jailhouse snitches, you all may recall, on cross-examination was completely discredited, where he had said, oh, I was in Bible study with him every day for three years, and then on cross admitted um, that the defendant had never been in Bible study with him. So there goes that witness. Philip, tell us your thoughts and the closing arguments and how you think they're going so far. I think the star witness for the defense is Carol Clip. Why on earth would anybody with no connection to this defendant, to the family, just call in the hotline to say they spotted the very person who's showing up in the missing person bulletin? Why? You know, there's nothing in it for her. I think she is the closest thing to an eyewitness. I mean, she saw this woman alive long after she supposedly disappeared and long after she was supposedly murdered uh, by Mr. Quillis. So uh, there is no incentive for her whatsoever to lie. And again, if she is alive, you don't have a homicide by this defendant. And if she 
turned up dead after that sighting, you cannot ascribe it to Mr. Quiles. Mm -hmm. You have to ascribe it to somebody else. I agree with you. The timing is everything. Yeah. And I do think that's reasonable doubt. But the jury is also considering what the state uh, reminded them of in closing argument. Let's listen together because there was a wiretap. And I want you to listen again to what he said on that wiretap. I think it is a machine ran over the bag, broke it open, it rained, it filled with water, you know what I'm saying? That's what you want. That's what I want. Me too. But she she been there for like, like you said, over a month. Over a month. Over a month. A deep, a decomposition, uh, decomposition should be at a rate of, of, of 75%. All right, and you can see that our team worked on transcribing that, deleting the words that we're not able to say or show you. But at the end of the day, Philip, I mean, talk about it's in his own words. Oh, yeah, I didn't shoot her in the head. I shot her in the heart. How can you overcome that kind of evidence? Great question. This is what you do. First of all, you bring in a false confession expert. You educate the jury on why an inmate would want to fabricate this, particularly with another inmate. Why would they do it? I'll tell you why. A lot of them are in fear for their own lives. Mm. As they're locked up, they're dealing with an element of scofflaw where they are in daily fear for their own lives. So by giving the impression that they're not afraid to take somebody out who gets in their way, it sends a message to his cell stay the heck away from me otherwise you're next but the truth is it never dawns on them that what they're saying could be used against them criminally later on that would have to be the argument I think it was a missed opportunity not to put on a false confession expert to explain the prison culture and the need for self-preservation even to lie to your cellmate and take ownership of crimes you didn't commit it's actually quite common especially in the gang world oh my gosh Melissa we have to take a break but just oh. yes or no and we'll come back to it later do you believe his confession on that wiretap? I don't I don't know if I necessarily believe it, but Philip is 100% right. There is this snitching culture and also wanting to have bravado in the prison systems and earn credit for being a tough guy so they're not messed with in the prison prison systems so it could be either way but great point that the jury doesn't have that evidence missed opportunity depends on what they decide still ahead more of the defense closing argument stay with us you're watching court tv your front row seat to justice tonight on closing arguments an in-depth profile of the accused killer in the delphi murder case what we know about richard allen and what his defense team is now saying about the investigation. And the civil trial begins today in the case at the center of the popular Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. We'll bring you the biggest moments from opening statements as this trial gets underway. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan, tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. Thank you for joining us. Back now to Florida, where the jury will soon be deliberating the fate of Jonathan Quillis. If convicted, he could face the death penalty in the murder of his pregnant niece, Ayanna Sawyer. She was last seen leaving school in 2018 to go see the defendant, her uncle, at a salvage yard where he worked. We take you back into court, pick up with the defense's closing argument right where we left off. You didn't want to be asked what happened? Again, nobody forced him to say the information that he said. What else is he lying about? Kamar Humphrey and IS communicated via Snapchat. He told you that. Now, of course, he wants to make it seem like they didn't communicate for that long. 
He's not dumb. He's not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, I was in communication with her for months and months and months. Oh, yeah, we had a sexual relationship for months on end. But guess what? I asked told her best friend that that was the case. They had been communication for months. They were in a relationship for months. I.S. was in love with him. Jose. Who is Jose? Hispanic and black male, or mixed, 20 or 21, living in Azalea Ridge Apartments. Willie Sawyer told you all that Jose was in these apartments. The state talked to you about a puzzle. They said each of these pieces, and they gave you a little graphic, each of these pieces is going to add up. When you look at all the evidence, you weigh the evidence back and forth, those puzzle pieces really all there? Or are there things missing? Are there puzzle pieces from another type of puzzle that don't fit? Are you forcing those puzzle pieces in? Or is it truly, does it truly make sense? Because let me ask you, IS is murdered at Ace Pick Apart, December 20th or December 19th. There's zero evidence, zero evidence of a crime occurring at Ace Pick Apart. No blood, no DNA, no cameras catching this happening. She's supposed to have supposedly been there overnight. According to Joseph Quillez and this supposed confession, he tried to strangle her and then left her there. Does that make sense? She just sat there waiting on him to come back? So much of the story doesn't make sense. Where is the physical evidence of this crime occurring at Ace Pick Apart? How could someone be shot in the chest, bleed, and there be no evidence whatsoever? He said to his brother, he did it in the yard, or that comes out on a wire. The yard is where everybody works, not some secluded area off to the side. How could you do this in the middle of the day where everybody's working and no one notice anything? There are people working in teams all over that place. You heard Gary Lindros tell you, there are people working in different stations spread out around. You'll see the video, review those videos. You'll see people coming in and out all over the place. It's a busy place. I think he said that they see 300 plus people a day. On the weekends, it's more. That many people going in and out and all over the place and no one notices anything. There's no physical evidence whatsoever. You heard on the wire that she was put in a bag. You heard Joseph Quillis tell you, oh, she was in a carpet. Can't have it both ways. We're just making up details now. So much of it does not add up. You'll see video of Mr. Quillis driving the forklift with a bucket without a bucket. You can see into the bucket. You can see on those camera angles. Look at that video. It doesn't make sense the way it's been told to you. Question that evidence. See if it does make sense to you. Let me talk to you a little bit about SS and her testimony. SS's testimony is rife with inconsistencies. She's changed dates. She's changed what's happened. 
how it happened, when it happened, how many times it's happened. She went from saying there was nothing at all that ever happened to describing in her own sexual abuse story of several occasions. But originally, what did she say? She said, nothing happened at all. I don't know anything about Jose. I want to know what you think. Let us know on any of our social media. Go tweet us at Court TV or at Ashley Court TV because I want to know, are you believing the defense that there's some reasonable doubt and the story doesn't make sense or rather the prosecution that he is guilty of murder? Stay tuned. We're going to pause. We'll come back and get you back into closing arguments. A tragedy in the Hollywood Hills. Prominent therapist Dr. Amy Hardwick found fatally injured under her balcony. Her ex-boyfriend on trial for her murder. She had had a restraining order against him. He strangled her, lifted her up over the balcony, and dropped her. He never intended on killing her. Is this a case of a jilted lover turned obsessive stalker? The Hollywood Obsession Murder Trial. Trial coverage today on Court TV. Prosecutors say defendant Jonathan Quilla shot and killed 16-year-old Ayanna Sawyer because she would not have an abortion. During closing arguments, the state said Quillis was left with killing his pregnant niece and destroying the evidence after he got her pregnant, 16 years old, his niece. Let's get you back into court for more of the defense closing arguments. December 20th. She was asked several times by police Hey, tell us about that conversation that you had with your sister at the picnic table. Tell us what happened. She kept saying it was nothing. So many inconsistencies in her statements to you all. So many things that now she can't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. You don't recall the things that you don't want to admit. SS is the only person who has said there was some code name for Jonathan Quillis. And what does she tell you about those code names? She actually added one. She said, oh yeah, he was also known as Eugene. SS's testimony is contradicted again and again and again by her, by her own words. Why, if your sister is missing, would you not tell police everything you know? Everything you possibly know. Same thing goes for the family, because according to Naomi Mobley, December 6, they were saying Jose was Jonathan Quillis. That didn't even come out to police until December 27th. Why would you wait two weeks after your sister is missing to say that type of information? She was protecting her? That's her excuse? That's her reasoning? She wasn't telling the truth. She had been told to say what she said. SS says she was told her sister was going to stay with her grandma. And that's why she didn't say anything. She knew immediately. She learned almost immediately that IS was not at her grandma's house. Her grandma, Nancy Ware, was informed. And yet, she still didn't think to say anything. But oh yeah, by the way, I'm being sexually abused, and I've overheard my sister, and I know that Jose is Jonathan Quillez, but I'm not gonna tell anybody that information, because that's protecting my sister. What other information did she withhold? She 
waited four months to talk about or to talk to police about alleged sexual abuse. She waited four and a half years to ever mention that she on one occasion was laying on a couch and overheard Jonathan Quillas and her sister having sex. Four and a half years. That never came up. She actually never even reported that to police. That was something that was said in a deposition. When they couldn't find IS, sister group is circling those allegations and accusations. They turn to SS. You're malleable. Go along with this narrative. This fits it. Now all of a sudden, this family is, oh yeah, we knew. Oh yeah, we saw the signs. But nobody reported anything for weeks. I saw this terribly inappropriate hug. I didn't like the way he looked at her. But you all did nothing? The hard part with SS is so much to keep track of, so many things to keep straight, so many stories to try and line up. It's hard to keep track of all of that. Let's take a moment before we reach the top of the hour to bring in our guest, retired police sergeant Melissa, Melissa rather Pinkleton and deputy public defender Philip Dubay. Melissa, let me start with you because again, the law enforcement, you've already said all the reasonable doubt that you see in this case. Do you think the defense is bringing it home in a way the jury can understand and think, wow, there is reasonable doubt? I think the defense is trying to do that. I think they're trying to scoop around the pots that were left behind there and the piles that were left behind. And I think that they're trying to form them into different piles, which look like uh, they're... It which look like beyond a reasonable doubt. I just personally am not seeing it. If I'm sitting on this jury, all of the things that I would need to give this conviction are not there. They're just not even there. The only other case I can compare it to, um, I don't know, I, I'm sure we all remember the Casey Anthony case. Mm -hmm. As guilty as we all believe she was, the evidence wasn't there to con yeah. convict her. It just wasn't there. And maybe they are seeing something else that I'm not, but I am not seeing what is necessary to be there for him to get a conviction on this murder. Yeah, and I love that analogy because the reality is the evidence has to be there. That's our system. If it's not beyond a reasonable doubt, they're acquitted. Now, I think the sexual battery charge, there's enough evidence. Philip, in the last minute, tell me your final thoughts today about this case. No, I think that this counsel is doing a good job, but she's pettifogging, meaning she is getting too deep into the weeds on inconsequential minutia and facts, okay? Can't see the forest for the trees, in my opinion. I don't mean to bash defense counsel. Right. She's uh, advocating quite uh, hard for her client. But she needs to focus on Carol Clip, okay? <laughs> Carol Clip. I wish she could hear you make your closing okay? argument. Okay, are you, you listening, counsel? Carol Clip Carol is Clip the reasonable doubt. saw your victim alive, okay? And there was no reason for her to call in a false lead. That bulletin existed for a reason. So in my opinion, if Carol is to be believed, it means that the victim is living in transcontinental America with her kids. There we go, reasonable doubt. Thank you to Philip Dubay, of course, for joining us. Our Melissa Pinkleton sticks around. A passionate state rebuttal is still ahead. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. And I'm Ashley Wil Wilcott. Who? I forgot my last name. <laughs> Ashley Wilcott. Get my tongue twister. We're both here today giving you your front row seat to justice. The jury in Jacksonville, Florida is hearing closing arguments in the pregnant niece murder trial. Prosecutors say that Jonathan Quilas shot and killed his own 16-year-old niece after getting her pregnant when she refused to get an abortion. Now, the girl's body has never been found, though the state claims he threw her body in a dumpster after rapping wrapping her up in a carpet. Now let's get you back into court for the last of the defense's closing argument. You get caught up.
Let's talk about those pills that were found four months later as well. Four months after IS goes missing, Don Quay and Parsley pills are found inside Kimberly Mobley's house, inside SS's closet. Naomi Mobley testified that her Amazon account was used. But what else did she tell you? She said, I had Amazon on my phone and on my laptop. This was in October of 2017. Mr. Quillez's femur was broken. He was recovering. IS and SS and their siblings would come over to the house. They'd help out. They had access to their Aunt Naomi's laptop. She said that they would use it often, play games. She claims no one had her password to her Amazon account. The Amazon account is up on your computer, and it's not signed out. You can have access to it. And we know that they used her laptop. Her credit card is saved to her Amazon account. All you need is for that Amazon account to have not been signed out, and anyone could purchase whatever they wanted on that. And don't forget whose DNA was found on those pills. Think of all the physical evidence that's been listed out to you. It's not connected to Mr. Quillez. There's no DNA that comes back to him. There's no DNA that comes back to IS. Let me talk to you about the red van. The red van was a family car. No one's denying that Mr. Quillez drove that car or anything along those lines. But what did Naomi Mobley tell you? She said, I told him to get rid of these cars. Our house is looking like a parking lot. So what car is he going to get rid of? A broken down vehicle? His Durango that he's put a ton of money into and what Naomi Mobley described as his baby car? Or the vehicle that she said don't sell my car. There's only one vehicle left to sell. Nothing nefarious about that. This is the logical vehicle to sell when they needed some money. The video surveillance. The video surveillance from the dates that IS is alleged to have been murdered are so critical. The area that the state alleges Mr. Quillis took IS, it's right in an area near a fence that's opened. A fence that's opened and you can see from the office. Gary Lindros told you, oh yeah, you can see right into that area from the office windows where I sit. Not only are there people working there, not only are there people fixing a fence, but it can even be seen. That area can be seen from the office. And this horrific murder is supposed to have happened right under their nose? A person's transported in there and kept there overnight and nobody notices? What did he tell you? He said, that's not even likely. Highly, highly unlikely for that to have happened. Not that anything isn't possible, but I'm just asking you what's probable. Police didn't investigate this fully. They set their sights on Mr. Quillas. He was their target. All the tips and leads and other possible routes they could have gone, they left hanging. They failed to properly investigate. They failed to follow up and check to make sure. It's 
State gave you a list of things that they believe prove premeditated murder. But I would submit to you that those very same things are contradicted left and right. Mr. Quillis' own words contradict himself, especially for somebody who makes up stories and elaborate and goes on and on with it, especially if he's been threatened to provide information about something he didn't do on a wire so that Morris McClendon can make a case. They claim that cameras, his activity at work, is going to prove something. I submit to you it doesn't prove anything. The fact that he left work, he had a legitimate reason for leaving work. And if he's on company time, it's no surprise he didn't clock out. I asked him if he went to go buy parts, would he have clocked out? He said no, he'd still be on the clock. As you all are weighing the evidence, questioning it, we ask that you would hold the state to their burden. That burden that we've talked about so many times over the last couple of weeks. Each and every element of the crime's charge must be proven beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. I've gone through with you tons of reasonable doubt. Tons of questions, things that don't add up, things that don't make sense, that leave you plenty of reasonable doubt that Mr. Quillis committed the crimes that he's been charged with. Talked about that puzzle. How many of those pieces have reasonable doubts to them? Because each piece of that puzzle that they showed you should be proven beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. All the elements, all of the pieces, they have to fit together. I would submit to you that when you look through, you weigh the evidence, we're going to find those doubts. As you come back to that, if you're left with that question, if you're not certain, if you don't have that abiding conviction of guilt, that is reasonable doubt. You all have options here. You have options for first, the first and second counts. There are lesser included. So if you believe, even after looking at all of the reasonable doubt that's been presented to you over the last six days of testimony, Mr. Quillis committed this murder. Look to his words then. He talked about it being a spur of the moment thing on the wire. Not something planned out. That's the difference between premeditation, I'm sorry, first degree murder, and second degree, that premeditated portion. There are lesser included options for you all if you get there. But I would submit to each of you that when you weigh the evidence, when you go through, when you question what has been presented to you, and you determine what's reliable and what is not, I submit to you that you will find Jonathan Quillez not guilty. Thank you.